If you want an outlet on the outside of your house and you're wondering if you can connect it from an outlet on the inside of the house, the answer is probably yes. But the question is probably how and probably wondering why didn't I think of this sooner? Maybe it's where can I add an outlet or should I add an outlet there? Who am I, an electrician? Well, I can show you how. It's really not that complicated if you understand what wires go where, and the where can there be outlets can go anywhere if you know how to get there. If you're reasonably handy with some tools, you are who can do the work of the electrician. Watch the transition. Welcome to Kyler's studio. We have a big deck with a nice view, but there's no power outlet out there. Now adding power somewhere is a daunting task, but lucky for me, there's an outlet on the inside that's about right where I want to add power on the outside. Now it's not a GFI outlet, but that's not a problem because I can add an outdoor GFI. Now remember, anytime you're next to water like kitchens, sinks, bathrooms, you want this ground fault circuit interrupter, a GFI or a GFCI outlet, same thing. Now they make these specifically to be weather resistant, so that sounds great for outdoors. But we also add this weatherproof casing around the whole outlet. This one I got is meant to be flush against a flat surface, in my case stucco. You can see how this works. There's an inner plate that's interchangeable for different types of outlets. This one's specific for the GFI outlet. So the cover plate for the GFCI, the rectangular shape, goes on the front of the outside casing. And then the screws that hold the outlet into the box is what also holds the casing together. Now the casing you can see comes with this foam that presses tight up against the wall to keep the water out. Now I got a box that could be mounted either vertically or horizontally. Once you stick the hinges in, you can see there's a place that says insert this end. Once you stick the pin in, it's designed to stay in that orientation. You can't really take it out that easy to switch it the other way. So I thought a long time about how I'm going to connect the inside outlet to the outside outlet. I need to run wire through the back of the inside outlet into the back of the outside outlet. So I found the stud. Originally I was thinking, oh, I can just run the wire through the stud bay into the back of the other outlet and have both boxes attached securely to a stud. But then I thought about, oh, there's all this insulation in the way and I thought it'd be easier just to use these, they call them old work or old construction boxes. They have these tabs that are connected to the end of the screw, so when you start screwing them, the tab flips up behind the drywall or behind, in this case, the wood, and then tightens down against the back of the wood or the drywall. And I thought that would be so much easier. And the depth of the wall is about the depth of the box, so I think I'm just going to put this right next to the other one, obviously facing the other way. With those tabs, I can pretty much put it anywhere I want. Now, when I peeked inside, I noticed the yellow. The yellow immediately tells me non-metallic sheathing, commonly known as Romex, 12 gauge wire, 20 amp circuit breaker, and I need two wires and a ground. If you don't know, a good clue is what the installers installed before. Look, two wires and a ground. Now, the hardest part about this project is placement of the outdoor outlet. If you're lucky enough to have a wall that's exactly the thickness of two gang boxes or slightly greater, then just drill straight back through your one outlet. But in my case, I'm offsetting it. So I'm going to do a measurement based off a similar or known reference point. In my case, that's a sliding door. I can see the same reference both inside and outside. So in theory, if I measure the distance off of the inside of the center of the box, and then measure the distance on the outside, I should get the exact measurement I need. And then the bottom of the box, I'm gonna put 12 inches. I think the most common is the bottom of the box is 12 inches and the top of the box is 16 inches. Now that measurement is intended to go from the finished flooring. So if you're going to be redoing the floors, you need to account for the height of the finished floor. So to be conservative or safe, to make sure I don't drill into the back of my other box, I decided to measure right into where my center of the box would be and then go outward from there. Now it's a good idea to trace the outline of your box to get an idea of where you want your outlet to be. Though once you start vibrating, on the wall the graphite just falls off so so i drilled into the center of where i thought i wanted my box to be and if i'm lucky here it'll just punch right through and i'll get to insulation and not hit a piece of two by four and not hit the back of a blue box okay insulation is good push it back in so far so good so then i'm going to use a discovery tool and tap now how do i know that this is the right place 
I have a story to tell. Once upon a time, there was an old soul who thought all that is required to cut through some stucco and wood is a jigsaw and a reciprocating tool. After all, we're only talking about an inch and a half or maybe two inches of material. He thought, perhaps I overestimated the abilities of a wood blade and a jigsaw. Now what is it, he then imagined, is behind this material? Now, yes, we have stucco, but stucco needs to stick. What does stucco stick to? That chicken wire. Now, if my calculations are correct, let me see. Oh, yes, a wood blade going through chicken wire is probably not the best thing. Now, let me think. Stucco is practically a stone. Ah, what cuts stone? Ah, yes, if we make a solid border, then perhaps we could just chip it out. After all, that's what the masons did for years before having to do electrical work. So, chip we shall. Create a border? Does it fit? No, of course it doesn't fit, the other villagers said. But that's the whole idea, thought the man. Now you see, he did not, under any circumstances, want to make the hole too big. Because he knew a hole that was too big would not be covered by the cover. And then as he worked along, he realized that he needs to tackle this layer by layer. Border the edges with an oscillating tool. Save your blades by cold chiseling the stucco in between the borders. And then use pliers and a wire cutter to overcome the magical shielding powers of the chicken wire. And then it was smooth sailing from then on. The oscillating tool sliced through the wood like a hot knife through butter. And from then on, the only requirement was to make it a little more rectangular and fit the box just perfectly. And Bob's your uncle! So since the incoming wires are coming through the top, I will make the outbound wires go through the bottom. Screwdriver, hammer, pop that tab. I'm going to feed my new uncut Romex through this tab to the outside. And since my hole is right next to my other box, I can just feed it right outside. Now this wire is bendable. If you want to bend the wire a little bit to try to fish it out the other side, sometimes that helps. Now from outside, I'm going to feed that wire into, it doesn't matter which hole you use of the outside, I will use the bottom. Seems to make the most sense since I'm coming out the bottom of the other one. Or if you're doing a whole project yourself, you may want to always come inbound in the top and then outbound in the bottom. That could make sense. So I want to pop the tab on the new box and feed the wire in it and then give enough slack in it to be able to wrap down around the back of the box. So I can push down just enough slack to get the whole box in there and then I can pull any extra slack back inside to the inside outlet. I can give myself enough slack and clip the end. Now, once my wire is fed into the box, I can secure the box. In my situation, I used a hammer to tap the box back to where the front tabs would be over the stucco, and then use those included old construction tabs to clamp it into place. Now, as far as securing the wire, on the outside box, the plastic tab held it pretty secure. On the inside, I used an unconventional clamp. It's a Romex clamp that's supposed to be used for circuit breaker panels, but it did prevent it from being pulled outside the box. Now, some might say per code, you need to secure the Romex to the framing within X amount of inches of the box. Now, one of those plastic clips or this clip does prevent it uh, from going outside the box from being pulled. So with such a short run, I would say that's secured. But it may come down to which inspector you get and their interpretation of the local code. So if you want, you can check with them. Now to the wiring. You can use a utility knife and carefully split off the sheathing of the Romex. It seems pretty common to remove the sheathing within an inch of the clamp in the back of the box and then pull off the paper over your ground. So for this application, you should have two wires, a black wire, a white wire, and a bare copper ground wire. Now I had so much extra ground wire, I'm going to clip it off so it's the same length. Now you can use big electric pliers to twist all these together and then twist a ginormous nut over all these wires. But in my case, I'm gonna use these push connectors called Wago nuts. These nuts are limited to four wires. There are four slots for four wires, which works perfect for this application. So the wiring for outlets is colors connect. So the black colors connect with all the black colors, the white with all the white, and the ground with all the ground or the green. So in this case, I'm going to use the pigtail method. So take about six inches or so of your new Romex wire. I'm gonna connect the ground first, 
So these wire strippers have a nice little hole in there where you can hook your ground wire, and that's so it can fit inside the ground wire screw. Now, the bare copper wire is your ground, and it goes to the green screw, also green wire. You can crimp it together and then use a screwdriver to clamp it down into place. The other black and the white wires, both ends of the pigtail, will need to be stripped. So strip off about roughly a half an inch of insulation. Inside those nuts, you want bare copper wire to be into the very tip and then you want it to stop right with your insulation on the base. Same with the screws on the outlet. You want all bare copper touching the screw, but then all insulation beyond the outlet. So one end of those pigtails will go straight into the Wago nut. The other end will be curved around the outlet screws. So you can use your pliers to curve those. Now the part you've all been waiting for, black to brass. They both start with a B, black to brass. And white to white, the white or the silver. White goes to the white. Now, as long as black goes to brass, it doesn't matter which brass screw you connect to on these because there is a little metal tab between the two screws that connects them. If that is separated, then your top outlet will be a different circuit than your bottom outlet. It's less common today with smart switches, but it used to be that a wall switch on the wall would turn on one side of the outlet. So for instance, if you had a lamp plugged into the bottom outlet, you could have that on a separate circuit than the hot plug on the top. So if that tab is missing, you'll want to double check your circuitry because what we're wiring here is hot outlets on both sides, which means once the circuit breaker is connected, everything is on all the time. So most commonly, it seems that there is line coming into an outlet and then load going out from an outlet and it just continues on. The pigtails just connect the outlet from the line coming in and the load going out. So in my case, there was a line coming in, so a black, white, and a ground coming in to the outlet, delivering power, and then another black, white, and ground going out, probably going to the next outlet. All we're doing is adding another load off of this same circuit. So I'm just adding two wires, an additional two wires going out to my outdoor outlet as an additional load, and the pigtails are just delivering that same power onto the outlet itself. Now I've seen the recommendation to wrap some electrical tape around the terminal screws of the outlet. Not really required, but if you have a metal box or you're considering that maybe your long bare copper grounding wire could connect the terminal screw to the box or the other terminal screw, then I would definitely consider that. So the rest is pretty common sense. You're gonna be shoving all the wires back in. I liked using the back of my screwdriver to help with that. Also make sure that grounding wire is not going to connect to your other terminal wires. Shout out to the spruce.com with this graphic explaining the difference between a short circuit and a ground fault. Now for wiring that GFCI outside, same thing, split your wires up by taking off the sheathing. Now the back of these outlets are gold with information. Some of them even tell you how far back to strip your wire. Now these outlets, you plunge into the back and then use the screw to tighten it down. Now your bare copper wire is your ground wire. You plunge it in and then tighten it down, the green screw. Now since the power is coming in, this is your line. So you will connect your black to the brass line and your white to the white or silver line. Both of these are line. Both of these come in as a line. Now, if you wanted additional outlets protected by this GFI, then you would take those out of the load. So this allows you to have a regular type of an outlet downstream of this off the load. And so if that gets a ground fault, it will trip this outlet. So you'll need to come and press the reset on this GFI. So if you have two deck outlets, you could wire a second normal type outlet off of the load here, and they would both be protected by this GFI. So the easiest way to connect the weatherproofing to this outlet is just use the top screw of the outlet into the box, not screwed in all the way, but just enough to where you can put that outside plate on top of the casing and notch that in, and then use your other screw to screw in the bottom of the outlet and tighten them both down. So you want your weatherproof covering to flip up from the top. So if it's horizontal, use the side hinges obviously, and then use the included plastic pin to insert one way. Make sure you do it right, because there's not really an easy way to redo it. 
And then I use some pliers to tear off that tab so you can leave a cord plugged in and have it be weatherproof while it's plugged in. Now when you finish the wiring, be sure to test your outlet. I love this little device because it tells you what you did wrong. Or better yet, maybe how to correct it. It's a little bit hard to see in direct sunlight, but this looks like it works. Also, you can use the button on it to test the ground fault circuit interrupter. It's the same as pressing the test button on the outlet itself. Just be sure to press the reset back in for it to continue to work. And if it's tripping on its own a lot, you may want to pull out the plug and make sure that ground bare copper wire is not touching one of those terminal wires. This project was so satisfying because now I can just come out on the deck and plug in something like a vacuum cleaner right there on the deck to finish up a project. You know the primary driver for this was to run our Traeger grill over there. It needed just a little bit of electric power so I literally had to pull out a backup battery to stick out here on my deck to smoke something and now with it being fully weatherproof i can just leave it plugged in which will be so nice i know it takes a bit of work to add something like an outlet to figure out all the intricacies of it but once you get it done just the fact that it can save you you know an extra 10 minutes and two flights of stairs is part of the joy in being able to do anything that you want to do Tyler Studio.